Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. I started working at Pivotal in the Groovy and Grails team in the beginning of this year. And uh, during this talk, I'll be talking about um, Rat Pack and Grails 3. And uh, first, a few things about the agenda. My talk is uh, something that came into my mind when the, the deadline of, of the call for papers was going on and I was thinking of a subject that interests me but I also had a hard time because I'm not an expert in this subject and you usually do talks about things that you really can handle and uh, this has made me very nervous when I've been preparing for this talk and uh, I then at one point decided that why don't I do just tell about the story and the way I was preparing for this talk and what I learned on the way and uh, what kind of things I found out so please join me in learning and don't expect to hear wise words or some best practices. I, I won't be telling those to you. So Grails 3, first so that we get into the subject, here's some of the goals for Grails 3. and Graham just went through a lot of these. So gr switching from a custom build system to Gradle is one of the big things. And it changes a lot of, a lot of things and the link to this talk is this uh, reaching outside the servlet container. And uh, that's actually how I, I got the subject for this talk. And it's, it's here, Netty. I, I picked that, that little word or project name and, and started digging into that. And Perhaps when you Google with Netty and Groovy, you'll quickly find Rat Pack. And in Rat Pack, you could also find Netty there. So, first of all, what is this Rat Pack about? Uh, Rat Pack, it's a simple toolkit for creating high performance web applications. And um, and it's built on on the, the Netty, Netty framework, so it's kind of a more usable API on top of Netty. And then, then comes the question that I'm, I'm happy with Grails. Why, why would I start learning new things and go into all this trouble with all this uh, asynchronous stuff? Grails is all fine. How 
Have you ever thought about this? Lift your hand up if you've had the same question. So, one of the main reasons behind this is uh, Amdahl's law. And it's, it's not only about uh, performance or, or speed, that when you do asynchronous stuff, that magically your application just starts going faster. This is a common misconception that asynchronous means fast. The real benefit of asynchronous is uh, the fact that you could take advantage of uh, multiple nodes and multiple processors and, and cores. Since um, if you can't parallelize the computation task you have, based on Amdahl's law, you, you can't go much faster. So, so this is what it, what it means that, um, that um, here's, here's a portion, these different colors, color of lines, they're, they're of the portion that can be executed in par parallel. And um, even if you have half of the tasks Execut executable in parallel, you won't get gain too much speed up, even if you add nodes or cores to the to to do the computation. And if you're doing something that you you have a very complex comp computation, and you have to be able to do it in a limited time, it's it's the only way you could. Uh, implement your application. However, I've, I'm not saying that this is a very common problem for, for, for most of you and most, of, most applications, but it, it certainly is an imp important aspect to remember. So the programming model that's, that's making the difference here. In declarative programming, the logic is expressed without uh, describing the control flow. So, This uh, allows things like uh, parallel execution. So when the programmer is doing his job, he's, he has to program without the call stack. So it's a different way of thinking. And the programmer can feel that uh, I'm not in control anymore. I don't want to do this style of programming. I want to be the boss. Have you ever sensed this? Have you tried? Uh, how many has tried uh, uh, this style of programming or is using a daily? Can you lift your hands up? Quite a few. So at first, it, it's you get a feeling that. Um, you don't like it, but but then, in the end, if if your your goal is somehow related to a problem that you have to be able to parallelize things, you have to start um, going into that direction. So, some of the examples of this uh, programming model 
is functional and reactive programming. And that's typically uh, a programming model where you do the logic to react to messages or events. So it's typically, you could also call it like message and event-based execution. And, and as um, everyone knows about search engines like Google, they've only been possible of this uh, distributed parallel computation algorithms like map reduce so that's that's a model where the programmer has let go uh, of the controlling the execution details and then we're able to achieve something something like like that so now let's dive into Rap Pack again and start digging into the code and, and, and learning, learning what's it about. And since most of us are, are programmers, we like, to, we like to look at code and read, read code. It might seem a little bit cryptic at first, but In, in some ways, it's also beautiful. You see all these braces going down there? <laughs> and this is an example from um, Rapac examples. And, and um, since I, I, I myself haven't, hasn't, haven't been doing uh, much with Rapac, I, I don't have, uh, I've been looking at Others, others doing it. So if we look at a little bit at that, that uh, this programming example, there's um, a Rapac application. It consists of a functional handler change chains. So in, in this uh, programming model, this asynchronous uh, declar declarative model, this is a real realization of, of, of that model in, in RAPAC. There's this concept of a handler, and, and then uh, RAPAC itself is, is very simple, and, and you could do different implementations of the of uh, handlers, and they could be composed together as functions. So that's the way how how it forms a whole whole, whole application. There's a there's a lot of, a lot underneath the covers, but but in in the programming, if you start programming with Rapac, you usually start there's this uh, Rapac DSL, which is which is a simple way to to do Rapac applications in in Groovy without knowing all the details of, of uh, the handler setup and and all all that uh, complex stuff. What would be quite complex to handle handle without a DSL like this. So there's a, there's a, typically you could have a small program in, in one file. So you could, you could have a multiple handlers there. But then when you start building larger applications, usually you start thinking of ways how to build modules. And in Ratpack, they've cho chosen uh, Goose or Juice for dependency in injection. So 
Juice is a, a lightweight DI framework. How, however, Spring, you could take components out of Spring, which would do the same, same thing as Juice, but it just happens to be in, in this that Juice has been the choice there. And of course, Rapack itself, you could, you could plug in anything there, but as a, Rapack as a plug-in ecosystem, they have be started building on top of uh, Juice modules. So some examples of uh, Rapack module contributions are, are integrations to Rx, Java, and Reactor. And these can be used to do asynchronous programming, like composing, composing asynchronous uh, functions. And this helps prevent callback hell. Then there's an uh, integration to Netflix Hystrix. And this, this is a library that has uh, some error resilience functionality, which is quite handy in a microservice uh, environment. For example, a circuit breaker pattern implementation helps uh, handle failure in a system where there's a lot of distributed services. And there's also others available. So at this point, is there some question to you, you want to bring up into discussion about Rat Pack? And perhaps there's me or some other who could answer these questions. Any questions? Okay, so let's go for a short demo then. This uh, <coughs> demo of not only Rapac, but since uh, the talk subject, subject was uh, Rapac and Grails 3. I thought I'd like to present something that is really about the talk subject. And that was also one of the original ideas of the talk that I could somehow build a prototype of something where I show that Rapac and Grails, you could use them together that it's that it's not they're not two different worlds in that sense that there's there's way to to bring different different components in in grails 3 you, it's it's not a grails itself isn't a monolith anymore it's it's something that could be reused as smaller parts and this is a little bit uh, similar short demo as uh, Graham showed about uh, using GORM and, and uh, let's see if Oops. Have to get the display. Oh, there it is.
So here, here I have a, a rat pack application. I've started this off with uh, lazy bones. Lazy bones is a project started by Peter Ledbrook, and it's handy for starting off a rat pack application. And here, here you can see the directory structure underneath the source directory. And there's also a Gradle build for, for that. And, and basically, in this uh, example, I have everything is in this small file, rapac.ruby, which is the D which is using the DSL of, of RAPAC. So. So this is a very, very simple example. I have two handlers here. The, the other one is using GORM, and this other one is using Groovy SQL. And from, I'll first start it up and we'll see what happens and then, and then look, look into it. So a rat pack application, it's uh, started off with uh, Gradle, and you just put run. And then there's a little surprise here. So it's this one, Spring Boot inside rat pack. So here it is. That's that's coming from from Gorm. So th this this is the logic that the handler that kind of uh, catches everything at the end, and that's returning that result. So you have uh, you have. Uh, the same as in Spring Boot GORM, it's it's using the exact same configuration way since it's it's uh, using Spring Boot in inside the wrap pack. It's embedded in there, and this is a module I I built for this uh, demo. But I'll be contributing this uh, to the wrap pack project, and if they accept that as a pull request, then that'll be included in wrap pack. And then I'll show this um, database handler, or it's a URL that uh, picks a URL with the database in the path and uses Groovy SQL. So if we go there. So there, there we can see the result. What, it, what is coming from, from the, database, that's behind GORM. So, it was doing doing this uh, SQL statement, select st star from person. And here you can see a special feature of of Rapac, it has a dependency injection to closure parameters. So when you write a closure, you could add parameters and it will be injected by the type. So in this case, I have set data source 
that's a type and that makes RAPAC look up into its registry for uh, bean is kind of tied to spring but kind of a bean in the registry and injects that to that parameter when it's called and in this uh, RAPAC spring boot integration what I made I implemented the uh, integration from RAPAC to Spring Boot so that whatever is in the Spring Boot Spring context, application context, you could inject that into uh, RAPAC. So, so that's, that's kind of a crucial part if you really want to do something with, uh, with uh, RAPAC and Spring Boot and, and Grails to, together. So this is something that's available today and uh, you'll, you'll find uh, instructions Oops, yeah, I don't Let's go back to the presentation So at Git GitHub I have this um, example and in the readme there's uh, instructions how to how to get the forked uh, rat pack I have how to build it in and install it locally so you could try this out so this is uh, this integration isn't yet a part of a uh, rat pack and uh, because it required s small little changes there, which I'll be sending a pull request. So any questions about that demo? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, oh yes, you're, you're right, that example wasn't... Uh, yeah, I'll repeat the question that uh, um, the benefit of RAPAC is uh, that it's asynchronous, but in this case, did you mean that it's blocking the, the call in this case? Yeah, that's th th that's true. Uh, a good ar argument. That this is not a good example of a RAPAC application because it's uh, it's blocking this this part. I didn't I didn't do that using uh, Quorum async support. I I should have done that. I didn't think about it when I was so so excited. I got that. Spring Boot showing up on the, <laughs> on the screen, but very good comment about the style. Please send a pull request that <laughs> for fixing that. So you could fork, fork that uh, example and, and fix that. Yep. Yes, there, there's, a, there's ways to handle that in, in RAPAC, so, so this, this was a bad example. So don't, don't do this it, this way, it was more to prove that the integration works than to show, show off a way how to, how to build applications in RAPAC. And if you go to the RAPAC uh, GitHub uh, you, you could find uh, better sa samples there. There's a book sample, which is a extensive sample of how to how to do it in a, a synchronous way. I could, we could actually look at the um, the code example I showed earlier. So, so here, here you could see see that it's uh, using synchronous operation that there's a subscribe it's it's not blocking blocking there and it's uh, executing this this uh, 
after after it gets a reply there. And I assume that in the background, in inside wrap packets, it's handling that with uh, background threads because uh, database operations they're usually blocking blocking operations anyway. So so there's a background thread pool to handle those those type of operations in a controlled way. Any other questions or comments? So we'll move on to another subje subject about modularity. So typically, your applications end up as huge monoliths and not as nice, small, little ones. But here's some thoughts about that. So modularity, it's the logical partitioning of the software design so that you get it a complex system to be more manageable for implementing it and for maintaining it. So this is the usual reason for, for trying to achieve, achieve modularity. And there's two measures and concepts that are used in, used in computer science literature. And this is, uh, I took this from the Growing Object Oriented Software book. This uh, definition that uh, coupling and cohesion are measures for describing how easy it will to be to do a change of behavior in some element in the system. So usually it rela relates to making changes that you want to have a modular application. Because when the m modules are coupled, then a change in one module causes a change in the other. And this turns, turns quickly into a ripple effect that when you do a small change here, you, it propagates all away through all the layers and the whole application. And I'm quite sure that many of us have experienced that in systems they have been maintaining. Then there's a other measure that's cohesion, which is also important since uh, when you partition something into modules, uh, you want them to be into in meaningful units that provide enough value in, in one, one unit. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later on in relation to microservice architectures. So as a conclusion, you, you usually want low coupling between modules so that you, you can make changes easier. And you want high co cohesion within a module. And that usually also means that it's uh, following the single responsibility principle. And here's the, here's the defin definition of a microservice uh, by James Lewis. And there's a There's quite a lot of uh, different definitions what a microservice is. And here's, here's one definition. And in common, the only thing 
most um, different parties uh, agree on is that a microservice is something that you deploy separately and it has a some at some level it has a single responsibility but this this can have very different meanings and and you could think that the container like most commonly it's thought that the container is the operating system that that's where you run a microservice service or a or, s or some kind of a platform as a service that you, you, you run and deploy it totally like separately. But uh, in some definitions, uh, microservice could be something on platforms where you could uh, deploy modules separately so you could update services separately. So I'm I'm not going to go go into detail of what what microservices are are exactly, but here's something to think about. So nano service that's something when when cohesion has gone wrong in in building microservices. It's an anti pattern where where a service is too fine-grained and that's when the overhead outweighs its utility. So when we're building microservices we just can't get too excited about it. We have to really think and uh, use common sense in, in designing architectures. Then a common principle is that uh, each service owns its own, own data. And this, this usually means that there's no shared data storage across multiple services. So if this principle is really followed, it usually means switching to a hexag hexagonal architecture where persistence is an integration and not part of the core. And if you were at Peter's talk yesterday at the Grails application architectures, Peter mentioned this in his talk in the Uncle Bob's article about the no database article. So this is uh, actually a real, really radical idea which might, or it, it actually follows if, if you go the microservices way. And it, it means that you have to switch the way how, how you, you, you design design applications, you're, you can't start with a data model and thinking of what you're going to store in the system. So that, that will cause a failure. Instead you have to start with the events and behavior, what the system is, is, uh, is actually doing. Because usually you don't build a system to, to store things. That's, that's an archiving system, but many systems, they're, they're actually built to service a pur purpose. They're, they're doing some kind of be behavior, and that behavior is, is a valuable part of the application. And related to this, when, when there's no shared data store in, in the software system, it, it c causes, uh, it drives to, to different kind of patterns of, of using data. 
and there's a there's this talk about data consistency models in in distributed systems, and this is the this is some of the roots behind behind that that you have small you have the data behind the services and and then you can't just join do a query that joins over your database all the all the data in with a consistent state at every moment y your system won't have a um consistent transactional state in the same ways as it does in, in applications which are using a shared database. So this is something that really changes the thinking there. And there's this concept of eventual consistency and that's something if you want to want to dig into this uh, subject you could uh, look that up on Wikipedia. There's nice definitions there about that subject. So it's also about uh, replicating data to, to other services. They have to replicate or keep some kind of rep replica of, of data so that they could do things like, like joining, joining information. But there's no single one one fits all solution for for that so there is no silver bullet asynchronous is not a silver bullet and this is actually this quote is from an article written by Frederick Brooks on 1986 and it's a very valuable paper of thinking about how to do software and in that paper he talks about or he divides the complexity of a problem into into essential complexity in accidental complexity. So when you're solving something, there's always uh, the complexity that you can, uh, cannot escape, whether you use uh, traditional ways or asynchronous ways. But then there's this uh, accidental complexity, which is, which is the risk and we could be the ones who are adding the complexity by, by bad design and uh, a synchronous design could be a bad design too so I'm kind of challenging you to bother yourself into moonshot thinking You don't usually like spend your time being bothered that you can't teleport from here to Japan because some part of you just thinks that it's it's not possible. But moonshot thinking and that's choosing to be bothered by that. So where we need some moonshot thinking is I, I think in, in Grails 3 we want to make that the best platform for building modular monoliths. So we're, we're looking forward to getting feedback from you and that you join, join in planning and let's, let's put the moon man on the moon. So modular monoliths, they're I think they're the third way of, of building monolith applications across multiple libraries and frameworks. And the true benefit here is that 
modules can be turned into true microservices when needed. So that instead, instead of uh, introducing accidental complexity by doing nano services in, in the beginning of the project, we could choose to do that later on if, if we, there's really the need for, for doing that, that we would benefit of a model where we could deploy different services separately. Because the hard part of microservices is that when, if you don't do it from the beginning, it's almost impossible to do it later on. So there's a very hard choice in when, when do you start doing that. So this is the problem statement for, for the moonshot thinking I'm requesting for and I, I hope you you join, join this. So, if you build it, make sure you're building the right it before you build it right. So, also in this, uh, solving this modular monolith problem, we want to fail fast and often here and try out different kind of things. And I hope the whole Groovy and Grails community can take part in that, those experience. So that was my talk and any questions? Okay, thanks. <laughs>